The hilarious and critically acclaimed Mitchells vs. the Machines is so positively bursting with Easter eggs, in jokes, and film references that you might wear out your pause button trying to spot them all. Yippee ki yay, movie lovers, I'm Jan, and in this video I'm revealing over a hundred crazy details and secrets hidden in the Mitchells vs. the Machines. Some spoilers ahead, so take care. The movie kicks off with a cell phone being crushed beneath the foot of a PAL robot, referencing the famous scene from the 90s robot apocalypse movie Terminator 2 Judgment Day of a skull being crushed underfoot by a killer bot. PAL, the name of the operating system and digital personal assistant who orchestrates the robopocalypse after being tossed aside by a human creator, is a reference to HAL 9000, the AI antagonist from Stanley Kubrick's epic sci-fi 2001 A Space Odyssey, who also turned against his human operators when he discovered they planned to disconnect him. The red dot on each of the PAL robot's heads is also a nod to HAL's depiction as a camera lens with a red dot in the middle. And at the dino stop, when Katie orders the two PAL robots not to take them, the dot on their head changes from red to blue, to subtly signal their change in character from antagonists to the more helpful robots they turn out to be. PAL also has the feel of the mega tech company Apple, and the shiny PAL retail store the Mitchells visit in the mall has Apple Store vibes. And coincidentally or not, if you rearrange the letters in PAL to APL, it very much sounds like Apple. When PAL is revealed to her creator Mark as the villain at the heart of the robot conspiracy, the evil cell phone swivels round on her chair, and you can see she's sitting on a small pile of books. The top one is the Master Algorithm, which examines machine learning and predicts the rise of a master algorithm that will come to a perfect understanding of the world and humanity. In the middle is the Art of War, the ancient treatise that has influenced both military and business strategy and tactics across the world, and the book at the base of the pile is titled The Singularity is Near, another real-life book whose author predicts that machine intelligence will eventually surpass human intelligence and bring about a technological singularity, an event which comes to pass in the Mitchells movie. The look of the movie's sleek white robots draws on Honda's humanoid robot Asimo, which was created in the year 2000 and named after sci-fi writer Isaac Asimov, which is especially fitting because the scenes of marching robot armies remind me of both the movie I, Robot starring Will Smith and the Stormtroopers from Star Wars. By the way, the filmmakers have said the robots use a fully developed robot language, which contains secret jokes for anyone who can crack it. You can see the robots using it as they type. To figure out the code, look closely at the scenes of the robots taking over different cities around the world, and you can see how each city's name is translated into the robot language. One of the best moments in the movie comes when the Mitchells are attacked by a mass of PAL-chipped machines and take cover in a toy store, only then to be confronted by a horrifying army of Furbies who begin to talk in their own language. <laughs> This Furby form of communication is referencing the original Furby toys who, when newly purchased, spoke a language called Furbish and were programmed to only begin to speak English gradually each time they were turned on. In the Mitchells, the Furby's vocalisations are suitably horrifying, hilarious and creepy at the same time. <laughs> Run! Mitchell's dog Monchi, with his ability to make the robots error and explode, turns out to be one of the MVPs of the movie. Dog shield activate! Dog, 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 loaf of bread, system error. <laughs> Celebrity dog Doug the Pug, who has millions of followers online, provided Monchi's barks, grunts, sneezes, snores, licks, and other assorted canine noises, while Monchi's character, look, and name were inspired by Monchichi, the equally excitable wall eyed dog of writer director Mike Rianda sister. The zany style of the Mitchells is truly phenomenal thanks to the animators being encouraged to embrace their wildest impulses during production. Because most of the movie is told from the perspective of Katie, who's a filmmaker herself, the animators created something they called Katie Vision, which is where her creativity and emotions spill out onto the screen. The idea was that it should feel as if Katie edited the movie herself, so you have 2D doodles and drawings as well as internet mashups, memes and filters popping up on top of the 3D animation, revealing more details about Katie's character and feelings within a scene. Interestingly, some of the freedom to experiment on this film came from the success of Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, as both movies were produced by Phil Lord and Chris Miller. 
Because Katie's a filmmaker, almost everything associated with her is a movie reference or easter egg. For example, look really carefully at Katie's socks, and you'll see they have the same hexagonal orange, brown and red pattern as the iconic carpet from the Overlook Hotel in The Shining. And in some real attention to detail, those shining socks even appear when Katie transforms the Columbia Lady logo into her own likeness at the very start of the film. And while characters from her various home movies rain down from the sky, the fact that some of them are food really brings to mind Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, directed by Lord and Miller, the producers of this movie. The bomb-shaped pin on Katie's hoodie is another Stanley Kubrick reference to his 1960s Cold War satire Dr. Strangelove, and like the bomb in that film, Katie's pin has the words Hi There written on it. Also on her hoodie are pins of Monchi, the logo for the California College of Film where she's been accepted to study, and a rainbow pin in a bit of foreshadowing to the reveal of Katie's girlfriend at the end of the movie. And the Lawn Wrangler's pin on her backpack is a reference to Wes Anderson's first feature film, the crime comedy Bottle Rocket. Some cool genre movie posters in Katie's room include horror legend Boris Karloff's Snake People, the zombie sci-fi creature with the atom brain, the monster movie It Came From Beneath the Sea, and Robo Slayers 4. And the title seems to be a clever reference to the Mitchells' own story about a family of four who defeat a robot uprising. The movie's subtitle, Rise of the Brain Exploders, is also a reference to how the Mitchells use Monchi to cause the robots to malfunction and self-combust. And another funny detail on the DVD is where it says it's brought to you by the visionary director of Zombie Flesh Picnic and Werewolf War Criminal. For her application to film school, Katie creates her own personal Mount Rushmore of director heroes, which includes Ladybird director Greta Gerwig, French filmmaker Céline Sciamma, Lynn Ramsey, whose most recent feature was You Were Never Really Here, and Harold and Maude director Hal Ashby. And there are some neat tributes in Katie's own assortment of short films to some of those directors. So her portrait of an idiot on fire is a nod to Siama's historical romantic drama Portrait of a Lady on Fire, while Going There references Hal Ashby's Being There starring Peter Sellers. There's Dial B for Burger, her homage to Alfred Hitchcock's crime thriller Dial M for Murder, and two hilarious looking sequels Dial B for Burger 2, Diagnosis, which as we can see from the injured burger on the thumbnail, follows up on the events of the first film where Monchi chomped down on the talking bun. Razzle dazzle, I'm a talking <laughs> And the final film in the trilogy is Dial B for Burger 3, Forgiveness, where it seems the burger on his deathbed forgives Monchi. The Perks of Having Only One Friend is a play on the coming of age drama The Perks of Being a Wallflower, plus Katie's feelings of being an outsider. I've always felt a little different than everyone else. While Katie and Erin is the Mitchell family spin on the Oscar-winning road movie Thelma and Louise. As for Monchi, Fear Eats the Soul, that's a riff on the mid-70s film that brought German filmmaker Rainer Werner Fassbinder his first international success. They Lived in the Jurassic Period is a dinosaur-inspired parody of John Carpenter's 80s movie They Live, where aliens disguised as humans rule the world. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. Oh. And I'm all out of bubble. And there's even an amusing riff on that famous line in one of Katie's good cop, dog cop films. I'm here to bust criminals and lick my own butt, and I'm all out of criminals. And there's also Katie's director on director Q&A, which sees her brother kitted out in the inimitable style of new wave director Agnès Varda. Some other interesting film titles on the screen are Oops, a wizard transformed us into chickens, which seems like it's riffing on Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Chloe, Will You Go to Prom might be a video prom -posal. another hint to Katie being LGBTQ+. And there's lots more interesting details in Katie's good cop, dog cop movies. Her brother, who stars as a hardened criminal, drives a car with a perfectly fitting license plate, Crimes. Some cool canine touches in the dog cop movie that Mark watches are a missing poster for a ball, a wanted poster for a squirrel, a stolen poster for a pair of slippers, and the motto on the precinct's wall is to protect and serve kibble. Pictures of other dog favourite objects also adorn the walls, including a fire hydrant and a bone. During their time barricaded in the dino stop, the post-apocalyptic world of the Mad Max franchise gets a shout out in Katie's dope plan to defeat the robots. Make a necklace out of robot fingers, Mad Max style, and become world-saving apocalyptic road warrior. Katie. When the Mitchells rock up to the Mall of the Globe, Katie name checks the second movie and writer-director George Romero's iconic zombie film series. This is like Dawn of the Dead. Yeah, and how'd that movie end? After the Mitchells lay out their plan to take Dan Pal on her home turf, then celebrate 
celebrate, there's a fun scene transition in the style of the 1960s Batman TV show. Mitchells engage! And as Powell tries to figure out how to stop the Mitchells, there's a funny freeze frame moment when she orders the robots to pull up all the family's flaws. An absolute barrage of details pop up on screen, including once brought up his favourite rib during a eulogy, looks at ex-boyfriend Carlo Maloney on Facebook more than is comfortable. Which given the SVU references elsewhere in Katie's films, makes me wonder if this is a wink to former Law and Order SVU star Christopher Maloney. And those family flaws continue with only pretends to like Fellini, kicked out of an olive garden for stashing breads in purse, showers with shocking rarity, doctor diagnosed chocoholic, and eats own weight in cheese puffs each month. And Pal also brings up much more of the Mitchells' online activity, including Aaron's dinosaur-obsessed search history, with him asking questions such as whether dinosaurs kiss and how to get paleontologists to reply to your emails. Then there's his crush on the girl next door, with searches such as does Abby Posey have a boyfriend and what is love? Mum Linda's inbox has revealing email titles such as parent teacher night apology, incident with your son and a lifetime ban from what looks like a best buy. It's almost like stealing people's data and giving it to a hyper intelligent AI as part of an unregulated tech monopoly was a bad thing. Of course despite being what Katie describes as the worst family of all time, the Mitchells do manage to save the world, though it's amusing how incredulous the general reaction is, with the cover of People magazine saying, a nation asks, these people People, really? Just below their family that saved the world headline. On the other hand, the aptly named Posies get a much more complimentary write up on the same cover. By the way, given the Posies' perfect online family vibe, the filmmakers had some fun casting model turned TV personality and author Chrissy Teigen and real life husband singer songwriter John Legend, who are also known for their social media presence, while their dino loving daughter Abby is voiced by actress, comedian, and writer Charlene Yi. Among the stack of films in Katie's home movie collection is Ito Papa Tambien, a gender swapped version of Alfonso Cuaron's hit coming of age film Ito Mama Tambien, which, like The Mitchells vs. the Machines, is also a road movie. Crowbar Jones is a hat tip to the in universe film series of the same name that appears in the Cartoon Network animated show We Bear Bears. Raptor High is probably a nod to the animated series Clone High, featuring adolescent clones of famous historical figures attending high school. The show was co-created by the Mitchells producers Lord and Miller. Fists of Furry is an animal-related makeover of Fists of Fury starring Bruce Lee. And Pugs in Space is a canine take on the recurring Muppet Show sketch Pigs in Space. Fear and Loathing in Central Michigan is a reference to Terry Gilliam's Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas with a nod to Katie's home state. Oh and notice how Katie's DVDs are marked as the K Collection, obviously pointing to her first name's initial, but also as a hat tip to the Criterion Collection and Kino Home Entertainment labels. Given the Mitchells are inspired by co-writer-director Mike Rianda's own real-life family, it seems fitting he voices Katie's younger brother, Aaron. Hi, would you like to talk to me about dinosaurs? No. Okay, thank you. He's loosely based on both Rianda and his fellow writer-director Jeff Rowe when they were kids. And Rowe also cameos in the movie as the man at the dino stop who really loves fun. Who here likes fun? Hey, I like fun! Trust me, bud, you do not like fun. No, I really do like it. Everyone says that about me. You lucky human! Also at the dino stop, Rowe and Rianda's first names pop up among the nameplate signs in the gift shop. Another cameo in The Mitchells is by YouTuber Elle Mills, who voices Hannah, one of Katie's film school friends. So good! And speaking of Katie's college mates, her fellow cinephile Dirk Foley is voiced by Alex Hirsch, who created Gravity Falls, the animated mystery comedy series which both Mitchells writers and directors Mike Reander and Jeff Rowe worked on as well. Mind blowing! By the way, Dirk's surname is a filmmaking in joke, as Foley is the process of reproducing everyday sound effects such as footsteps, opening doors, or breaking glass glass, which are added into movies during post-production. Owen oh, Katie's film books also contains a hat tip to Dan Hansen, who worked on Disney animations including Aladdin and Hercules, and also taught at Cal Arts, where this film's directors both studied and became friends. And one of the Mitchell's CG supervisors, Ben Aguillon, also gets a name check as writer of Lights, Camera, Angst, suitably enough as he also supervised the lighting team on Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. 
So I was completely blown away by the animation and incredible details in the Mitchells vs. the Machines, but what did you notice that I missed? Let me know in the comments below, and if you enjoy discovering easter eggs and other hidden details in animated movies, then tap left for my full playlist, or you can tap right to check out something else you're sure to like. Thanks for watching and see you next time, yippee ki movie lovers!